another a barn yet another barn but they are really neat things and so uh, especially when they're historic barns and uh, when we go out and shoot these uh, sets actually Mike Fagan goes out and shoots these and he picked this one probably to drive me crazy because uh, it's got to do with an architectural nightmare However, uh, that's why I started sketching it a little bit before we went on the air. It takes some time to figure these things out. I can talk about it uh, endlessly, but to do it is another thing. And it's sort of reminiscent of the time when I was doing one of these barn pictures that uh, I chose, and Mike went along with it, uh, that um, uh, I did five, six windows, and the man called me up live on that show that night and said, aren't there seven windows in that barn? Which makes me think that maybe Mike took his cue from that and decided that he was going to do play the old barn game with me and windows so we've now counted these windows and i'm expecting that uh, there will be a check on this so there is four six well ten thirteen windows which is luck i suppose thirteen for good luck these this is the general way this is going to be titled the barn or the grist mill which is what it is the grist mill is in saddle rock which uh, is uh, here on the island just north of hempstead and um, it's, a, it's a, a really wonderful old building. It was built in the, um, in the mid-16, no, no in, the, in about 1702, the, the turn of the century. But it's called um, Mad, Na uh, Mad Nan's Neck, isn't it? Isn't that the one? Yes. Mad Nan's Neck is the original name of Great Neck. And uh, the story comes about that in, in the, um, in the mid-1600s, a woman called Nan Heatherton uh, came down from Lynn, uh, Massachusetts and uh, claimed the entire Kings Point area. She arrived at Kings Point and claimed the entire area in her name, which I suppose you could do at that time, but it's what I would call the ultimate uh, uh, 17th century chutzpah. You, you go and you say, this is mine, and you simply settle here, and then you and then you uh, lay claim to it and defend it vigorously if somebody comes and tries to tell you that you don't own it. And that's what this Nan Heatherton did. And because of her methods and because of her determination, she was called Mad. And hence the name Mad Nan's Neck. It sounds like Mad Man's, but it isn't. It's Mad Nan's. And then a man came along and his name... Uh, was Henry Allen, and he came along in the 1700s, about 60 years later. We don't know what happened to Nan. Uh, Nan, with all her, uh, with all her uh, ultimate chutzpah, uh, sort of disappears from the history books, and Henry uh, Miller takes over when he built this grist mill. And the grist mill, of course, uh, was, the, um, was the mainstay of nutrition at that time. Yeah, without a grist mill, you didn't grind your corn, and without the corn, you didn't have your bread, and without your flour, you didn't have anything. So uh, the, um, the need to, uh, to have a grist mill at that time was essential. It's almost the same as having the local grocery store now or the bakery down the road, Entenman's, for instance. In, on Long Island here, we have to have Entenman's, otherwise nobody eats. And uh, at that time, the grist mill was one of the most essential parts of a life in, on Long Island at that time and continued for many, many years thereafter. So uh, the, um, the uh, existence of this mill, especially that it's made of wood, 
is uh, really astonishing because if it's made of wood, that means that it is uh, inflammable. And for anything to have existed all this time with the possibility of fire at every given turn, especially if you, um, especially if uh, uh, kerosene lights or candles were the things that were in order, which is what it was, the, the fact that these places uh, did not burn down is, is already remarkable. And so, here is a wooden grist mill dating back to 1702, a fast 200 and, <laughs> yeah, a lot of years, uh, almost 300 years. And so um, we have here, uh, a, it's on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's got 13 windows, which I think that I have to keep reminding myself. And the windows were, of course, because the, the work was done uh, in the daytime in this enormous building, and uh, there are no skylights, obviously, so you had to have the ability to see what the heck you were doing when you were grinding the corn. Here is the general layout of this particular thing called the grist mill. I have no environment around it. I don't have, I'm not really introducing very much of anything that's going on around it, just a few trees, and um, because the, the interest of it is the building itself. And uh, I'm going to squeeze out some of this uh, MG quick drying white for my sky arrangement and take my handy little plastic uh, palette knife, which I, uh, which I bought the other day in Fort Jefferson, two for $1.99. What a bargain. And now at that point, you can afford to lose them. And people do ask me about my supplies and where I get them and so on. So here is the, uh, here is the, uh, the section of this program that tells you about the economy or the expense of painting. Uh, there, is, uh, there is the need to put the background in first. This is part one, naturally, of all of these programs that are done in two parts. And, um, oops, not too far, not too fast. S uh, speed, of course, is in, the, uh, is, is in order because uh, speed means that you are uh, keeping up with the track of the sun. When you're out there, if I'm painting in the in the studio here, and it doesn't make any difference. I don't have to worry about speed, but I'm talking to people who are going to actually go out and work from life, and that uh, this is in the back of uh, this is in the back of everybody's mind. Uh, that uh, how can I get it done quickly enough? Well, the palette knife gives you the opportunity of making large areas of color rather rapidly. To uh, not not to play a race, uh, not to think that you are going to be the, the fastest painter anywhere, but because you are dealing with a time factor. Uh, the, um, the interesting thing about these historic places is that uh, you do not have to go to Williamsburg or to, uh, uh, to northern uh, uh, New York State or down to uh, Monticello and, 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 and um, historic places like that to see landmarks. They're right here in our own area uh, for us to take advantage of, for us to watch, to look at, and to go and visit, and then become... Uh, uh, yeah, truly involved in possibly the preservation of these places or even just uh, purely in the interest and attending them and whatever tiny fee is charged to get in that supports the existence of these places. What a pity it would be if they did not exist. We would, I, I think, really be the, the losers in that kind of a deal. Uh, according to the monitor, I see that there is a, um, there is a sort of a, uh, the beginning of possibly a uh, rain cloud. So I'm going to, at, that, at this point, uh, show you that over the palette knife, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, talk about, uh, in color, the, uh, the introduction of a dark uh, and impending rain cloud, which makes for atmosphere and makes for an interesting uh, an interesting painting. Paintings have to have interest beyond the subject matter. And so uh, just the subtlety of saying that the, uh, this, this rain cloud is, is coming in, hovering over the barn, maybe uh, tells uh, something more of a story than I had intended, but it's possible that you know, the barn having survived many, many, uh, many, many years uh, in this particular location. It has not been moved from anywhere else. It was built here, and this is where it's remained. And maybe this, this can be symbolic of the, um, of the uh, first of all, the quality of the building and the fact that it was built to stay. And, it, and a grist mill had to have an enormously uh, sturdy uh, underpinnings because it dealt with, the, uh, with water. And water, of course, is, um, has a mind of its own, and it tends to need to have a great deal of respect given to it. And when you build something with water involved, you make sure that it's solid. This is obviously a, a natural stone foundation. 
and uh, I'm sure that in the, in the inside, and I certainly would like to go in on the inside sometime and see the rafters of this place because I'm sure that they are probably quite impressive uh, in the way of um, in the way of architecture. Uh, the um, the cloud uh, the cloud seems to be also hovering over this part of the barn, and as I say, we always do the most distant place first, and. Um, uh, the sky, obviously, being the most distant, and then you are, are able to the uh, overlaying of the painting of trees and uh, uh, clouds and so on. So I love the idea that uh, this was shot on a day when uh, we're, we're impending spring rainstorm. Uh, fortunately, the spring is almost upon us in, uh, at this point, and the uh, greens are going to begin to appear, but for now, it is still the, uh, the tail end, the last uh, fleeting breath of winter time but with the promise of uh, green things, because grass always gets green before anything else. And the grass in this one, as you can see from the monitor, is certainly peaking up, uh, and the snow. Fortunately, thank, thank whatever weather pattern, the snow has finally gone. Um, we, we contemplated doing another snow picture, then I thought, no, I shall be drummed out of town on a snow shovel if I do another snow picture. So anyway, we have an impending, wonderful, brooding, dramatic sky to go over this uh, 18th century barn, early 18th century, as a matter of fact. 1702 is, is almost on the other side of that century. And uh, it, it, the, um, the uh, nice solidity of it is great. But I, I sort of love to think about the idea of this Nan Heatherton, this woman that uh, came, made a landfall. She arrived at King's Point. Now, she was in a boat, obviously, and had a small contingent of people from Lynn, Massachusetts, which is where she came down from. So you get into a boat in Lynn, Massachusetts. Obviously, it has sails. It's way the heck on back there in 1650. And she gets onto this boat with these men, and she lands at King's Point, and she puts a stick in the ground and says, OK, this is mine. Well. That's some lady. And uh, as a result of that, uh, of course, she was questioned. And uh, people were saying, what do you mean it's yours? And she just defended it to the hilt until suddenly history uh, swallows her up and Henry Miller makes his entrance. But I dearly am fond of the idea that a certain Nan Heatherton may have been the preamble to uh, her own variety of women's lib. And there she was out there plugging away at her claim. Here is a sort of a greenish uh, tone for the roof of this barn, which is, in fact, um, I believe it looks like it probably could be a slate. Uh, and it has, a, it has a sort of a, well, it has a weird color. And I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, so, sort of give you the feeling that that color is grayish green. And then there's a break in this hip roof. And then it continues to be the long expanse clear up to the, the hay baler or the hay, uh, the hay lifter, this, uh, this uh, part of the roof that uh, pro projects past the roof line and over the water so that the um, barge uh, that would bring uh, the, the um, or yeah, if the barge brought the, the, um, the grain in or the hay or whatever it is that they brought in and uh, that they would be able to lift it or uh, lower the grain in barrels from this uh, hoist here. I'm, I'm guessing this. I'm not an historian of barns, but I have a very good imagination. I also have the ability to sort of decipher and deduce what all these things were for. Um, up here at the top is that, uh, is that little hoisting area. And it's uh, in shadow, therefore it's darker. And I shall just put it in uh, right now. Here, this part sticks out this way, and then here's the little part that's, that uh, protrudes from the, uh, from the building. And uh, there was a hook in here, obviously, and a chain in a rather powerful way, probably some, uh, some sort of a, some sort of a well uh, cantilevered uh, hoist going on back here. And this is the part of the, uh, this is the part of the barn that, uh, that is the business end of the barn. Here we have the ability to uh, take care of the grain that we just that you just uh, had uh, ground. Here is the break in that hip roof, barely visible at this angle, but it is nevertheless there, and I insist upon showing it because it doesn't make any sense to, to have a hip roof on one side and no, nothing visible on the other. Let me let me uh, get this brush clean here. Um, when the sun hits that roof, it becomes actually quite green. Uh, probably either that or it's the or, or it's the um, the electronic. Um, uh, TV thing that I'm looking at. The um, this is this break 
let me see, it goes like so, and then it, and it, and it, and then it runs down. I am so conscious of the uh, sense that things I have to make that I have to concentrate on something uh, for a while to get it accurate. Uh, not because I'm I'm not an interpreter as well, but I also uh, also don't want to be able to find myself in deep trouble architecturally with these things, whereby the whole thing looks like it can't make any sense at all. So here we have the beginning of the study of this old grist mill, and um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, mix up the color, tell you about it as I go along. It's all wood shingles, obviously cedar shingles, and they are a combination, I suppose, of this of this thing called flesh tone. And uh, a touch of uh, a touch of alizarin crimson, oddly enough, I think there is a certain uh, mauveish quality to this, and I'd better mix up enough so that I don't run out of it. Uh, okay, we need more more white. Every color that you mix is a base of white, um, except of course uh, purely very very dark tones. But for the most part, you have to have pound tubes of white. This is a huge pound tube. That's why you need it because you use so much of it. Uh, Okay, there's some orange in it, and there's probably a uh, subduing tone uh, of, uh, let's say, a little bit of this, uh, a little bit of this um, ultramarine blue. Uh, this is t the, the the color of shingles is is varies a great deal with the time of day as well as the age of the shingles and the um, and the uh, the amount of light or shade that is thrown upon it. So uh, shingle colors are. Quite difficult to fool with. They, uh, they're, they're, they're never really the same twice. I've just put a touch of black in there. And let me just run a swipe of this down the side of the building and see if it has any resemblance whatsoever to the color. Let me see. Uh, that may work. That might work. Let's let's see if it can work. If it doesn't, we'll uh, we'll run a uh, we'll run a glaze over it and see if we can get it to, to be uh, more accurate actually than that because uh, it's like the skin tone of a human being. Uh, it has to be the right tone. Otherwise, you've lost the resemblance and the the tone of this um, of these uh, of these shingles uh, has to be as close to uh, to to real thing as possible. Um, there is a grist mill in Stony Brook that is still running, but this is one of the few. Uh, but this is the only one that I know of, and there's also a one out in the Hamptons. Uh, not a grist mill; that's a windmill. But it does grind. Grind. It, it is capable of grinding grain, and so once again we have another preservation thing here uh, on, on a building that is within our reach. Okay, we will break for just a second. I got the little signal and let me take a break for a moment. I'll be back in a matter of moments.
once again shingling, shingling the old barn and trying to get the uh, the coloring, which is always very, very variegated. And I was I just uh, was told that the uh, the roof on this building actually is uh, wooden shingles. It's not slate at all. So the color that has taken place up there is uh, weathering. And uh, shingles, uh, cedar shingles particularly, have a weird way of uh, of doing the unexpected. Some of them turn dark, and some of them turn uh, pale, and some of them turn orange. And so that's always the interesting part of doing with these textures. Uh, I think that the monitor is telling me that the uh, the uh, protected part of these shingles, just underneath the eaves of the roof, have turned pale, uh, probably because they start out as pale, and the weather has uh, the uh, has. The lack of weather has prevented them from turning uh, from turning dark, and so I've got to I've got to uh, make sure that I um, that I convey that message to the viewer of this uh, of this picture that underneath the eaves of the roof there is a pale area of shingles. This all makes for the interest of um, of realist painting. Uh, I think that uh, I think that anybody who who really is, uh, likes my work and appreciates the fact that I am such a stickler for detail means that they recognize things that they might otherwise not have been totally aware of. Um, when uh, when Henry when Henry Miller uh, decided to uh, to uh, open up this grist mill, he became extremely successful, and was in that was in that family for many many years, generations as a matter of fact. And then along came a bunch of people called Udall. Now that may be an, uh, a name that is familiar to some, and uh, the uh, the Udalls owned this until the 1950s. Uh, my my research on it sort of stops there, but I'm not sure that that's important. The point is that it has been in, in very few hands uh, for almost 300 years. Uh, that's an unusual thing. Uh, the uh, the changing of properties in uh, over a period of time is a perfectly normal uh, behavior, and uh, when when it when it doesn't happen that way, you have to make note of it. That it is interesting to see that um, sometimes the uh, sometimes the changing of hands takes place uh, very very seldom. Uh, the building changes color here. Those these these uh, shingles get to be extremely dark, and I'm going to be using some some uh, alizarin crimson, crimson and some uh, umber uh, as as the uh, c uh, the color gets progressively darker as it uh, go goes down lower toward the building. Weather does all this, of course, but um, it is up to the painter, the artist, to um, or the observer. And I think that everybody should become an observer. It's great. Uh, it makes life much more rich to be highly observant of things. And I, I'm always a little saddened when I uh, see very young people not uh, noticing or being observant of uh, things that are around them and prove to be extremely interesting in uh, in the final analysis. Ooh, ooh, it turns sort of gray down here at the bottom, doesn't it? The uh, those shingles uh, have have met some intense weather, and so they're oops, they're down here getting very quite quite pale, uh, all very, all, all very plausible, and also all very important in the, uh, in the rendering of something like this. My wall continues down in this, in this color, which I fortunately had mixed enough of, and here is the corner of that building, and it has a, um, it has a, um, well, what, what that vertical piece is on the corner of buildings, I don't know. However, it's a white one, and it comes down there, we'll put that in later. There is, um, so, th so there is need for a tremendous amount of attention being paid to these, uh, to the characteristics of these of these studies. The characteristics of anything, just like in people, are always interesting, and um, it's uh, it's to everybody's advantage, especially the uh, observer, to be aware of these uh, of these characteristics. I uh, I spoke to uh, some people recently about the characteristic of uh, of the. Uh, President's homes, and uh, we, uh, some people were taken down to uh, to George Washington's uh, house uh, down in Virginia and visited it. And they were from Europe, and uh, in, it's not a great big palatial building. It's uh, it's a quite a beautiful, very large, rambling building. But guess what it is? It's a farmhouse. And this person from Europe, we was asked, "What did you think of that? Uh, what did you think of the George Washington's home?" And without any condemnation, and without any, um, without any, uh, anything more than just the observation, this person said, "It's a farmhouse." And that's really interesting to me that uh, somebody's observation is absolutely true. That uh, that we may have forgotten 
not forgotten, but not been totally aware of the fact that George Washington's house was, in fact, a very large farmhouse. And that, that's always rather interesting to me. That, um, and, and I'm sure that the people who take you on the guided tours tell you that. But uh, that was the observation of this fellow. And he was surprised because he came, not surprised, but he just observed it, that the people who are, were in, uh, in the, um, running the countries abroad, they lived in palaces. A big stone, marble, God knows what else type of palaces, and certainly not in farmhouses. Uh, so, just an interesting point. The, um, the, uh, the grist mill, as I said before, uh, is a huge building, but it certainly does not have what you would call uh, amenities of any kind. It, uh, it is strictly a uh, utilitarian building needing to be extremely strong and needing to function uh, uh, on a daily basis at high level of performance. Uh, I'm going to just indicate uh, the shingles with a very slight uh, line. The, the business of putting shingles in one by one is, uh, is not necessary, it's also not interesting. Just a suggestion. Of these uh, of these shingles is about all I think that any of these things need, and it can be done with the with the uh, sharp end of this square cut brush, and um, to uh, to 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 denote that uh, this is it is absolutely positive that everybody knows that these shingles are um, are shingles, uh, so you don't have to draw the verticals. As a matter of fact, the verticals are barely even visible. It is the um, it's the uh, shadow part of each shingle which is visible to the naked eye. Also, they seem to they they seem they because of perspective. They changed direction. They were going up that way from there, and they are now heading in another direction because of what perspective does to things. And that's the only thing that to really be concerned about is the manner in which these shingles uh, are running their course, as it were, along the facade of this building. Um, did uh, I, I, is, is there is there there is a need for a break very soon? And um, okay, two more minutes. Good. Um, I, I don't have my watch on, as you can see, which means that the time flies, and I'm really not quite aware of, of how, how how much time has gone by. So the uh, the um, rendering of these shingles should probably be certainly no more than this, and a little bit rough as they are is a probably good idea. Not as crooked as that, for heaven's sake. I get that out of there, and because they are put up with a certain amount of diligence and a certain amount of, of craftsmanship. So they can't possibly go running off like that there, so I'll correct that later. But the same thing happens over here. Now, underneath this eave is an extremely dark area. Uh, I'm using some pure umber with this because this little roof, which is a shingle roof, just been told that it's not slate at all, it's shingle, um, it casts a very strong shadow underneath it. Uh, almost black, if you, if you would, uh, if you, ah! Uh, let me get my palette knife and remove that enormous uh, blot here. Good. See? Easily corrected. Uh, the ca shadow being cast under here gives you the definite demarcation between the roof and the, uh, and it's good and strong and uh, needs to be in there almost right away. Uh, and, uh, and blend it if possible. If possible, to blend it because the, this is not a strong line. Let's see if I get this. You can just, just sort of blend it as you go and, um, and get rid of the harsh lines. Those harsh lines are, first of all, uh, untrue. Now, before I break, I'm going to do what I did, uh, what I've done before. Put the dark part of the windows in right now so that when the time comes for me to, um, to do the mullions, that the paint will have set somewhat. Uh, so these windows, because you had to see through them, the barn being a big, dark old place, there had to be many, many windows for the uh, ability to work there in the daytime. Uh, machinery had to be fixed, machinery had to be monitored, and uh, uh, weights, and uh, weights and measures had to be uh, very carefully taken care of because uh, I understand that in the old days, if you shortchanged somebody uh, with the amount of grain that was real fighting words and was uh, the basis for many uh, a, a vendetta, a feud, and conflict that lasted for generations. The families simply carried these vendettas over uh, as the years went by if there was shortchanging. So weights and measures was extremely important at that time. Okay, okay, we'll wind up. Let's just um, close up for just a moment, and I, and I will be, uh, I'll be back. Oh, it's the end. Oh, good. See, it's gone and done it again. The half hour has flown. I thought we were at the midway mark. Anyway, it's the end of part one of the gristmill painting, and I shall be back uh, to do a half hour some other time to show you the end of it. Thanks again. I hope you liked it. Bye-bye.